In this lecture, we will be continuing our treatment of autoregressive 1 processes. We will focus on the properties of an AR1 process. So first, let's recap. The idea of an autoregressive process, YT, is that it's a weighted average of its past values plus a white noise term. So here's our definition. If the epsilon 1, 2, 3 sequence is a white noise, with variance sigma sub epsilon squared, then we say that the sequence y1, y2, y3 is an AR1 process if for constant parameters mu and phi, this equation 1 holds. And the way we think of that is, if you think of time as in days, the way that yt differs from its mean today is remembering a piece of how it differed from its mean yesterday, plus a noise term that reflects the addition of new information. Mu is the mean of the process, phi is the memory, and the process is stationary if the absolute value of phi is less than 1. So we looked at, in the previous lecture, the different cases. If phi is 1, your AR1 is nothing more than a random walk. If phi in absolute value is bigger than 1, then your AR, K, your AR process is actually non-stationary and is explosive. Explosive in the sense that the variance of yt is increasing in time. But we get stationarity, weak stationarity, if phi in size is less than 1. And so we can think of the case when phi is less than 1 in size... We can think about, if phi is positive or non-negative, think of it as a percentage of memory of past values. So think of this as this phi in the, the case we just described as being a percentage between 0 and 100% of memory of what happened yesterday. That being said, let's look at the properties of our AR1 process when it's sta weakly stationary when phi in absolute value is less than 1. So we remind ourselves, here is the definition of the AR1 process. And first, we have to recognize we need one of two assumptions. First, we either need to start off the process at some initial why not. And for this to work, the why not has to have the same mean and the same variance. We'll describe this as the variance below. But you have to have y not having the same distribution in terms of its mean and its variance as your yt. So that's one assumption that, that needs to be made. Or the other assumption is that your yt has an infinite history. And this is because, right, if yt remembers this is yt remembering something from yesterday. Well, the term from yesterday remembers, remembers a term, something from the term from the day before, which remembers something from the day before. And so you can keep on going back infinitely in time, and you have an infinite history. Typically, we are going with the first assumption, because in most applications, you do not have an infinite amount of data. And so you need to kick it off with some initial distribution or at least an initial mean and variance. And note that that mean and variance are actually the mean and variance of the process itself. So our AR1 has mean mu, and it has variance sigma epsilon squared over 1 minus phi squared. And remember, the sigma epsilon squared is coming from the white noise distribution. And you can derive both of these things it's a standard exercise to do so directly from this equation using the fact that we have a stationary process. So the mean of yt and the mean of yt minus 1 are the same. The variance of yt and the variance of yt minus 1 are the same. When we talk about time series, a key issue we look at is that of autocorrelation and autocovariance. So again, we have this top line to remind ourselves of the definition of the AR1 process. And we define 
the autocovariance function for lag h. And so h, think of as integer valued, and it's going to be the lag, the amount of time in between entries in your sequence. So if we draw our timeline, we have t, t plus 1, up to t plus h. So our h is the length of time between the entry yt and the entry yt plus h in our sequence that forms our AR1 process. Our result is the covariance between these two things. So that's, that's going to be a measure of dependence between yt and yt plus h is equal to this sigma epsilon, sigma epsilon squared over 1 minus phi squared. R recognize that as the variance of the process itself times phi raised to the absolute value of h. And notice we put the absolute value of h because we define the lag for integers. So whether you're saying um, this is a positive h or a negative h, what matters is not the, the sign of that h. It's just how far spaced apart in time are these two entries in the time series. So what this tells us is that the covariance between yt and yt plus h is a function of the variance of the white noise terms and the phi, right, that's our memory parameter, and then h, the amount of time in between these different observations. If we want to get our autocorrelation function, or the ACF for lag h, which we denote as rho of h, that autocorrelation, it's a similar idea to the autocovariance, it's the correlation between yt and yt plus h. And to obtain that, we take our autocovariance, our gamma of h, and we divide out by the variance of the process. And the variance, another way of writing the variance of yt. That's the, that's, you can write that as the covariance of yt and itself, right? The case when h is 0. And so you can write that as gamma of 0. So when we divide by the variance of the process, recall that the variance of yt is exactly sigma epsilon squared over 1 minus phi squared. So when we divide the autocovariance by that, this entire first term canceled, and we're just left with phi raised to the absolute value of h. And this tells us a lot about this type of process. And so this is the graph of the autocorrelation function for two different cases. So we have a case here, this top case, when the memory parameter is 0.9, and then we have this other case where phi is a little smaller, or 0 0.5. In this graph, right, if it's, an, if it's a correlation, you know, a correlation has to be between negative 1 and 1 by definition. And this tells us, right, up here, this axis is your row axis, and down here is h. And so we see h, say, at lag 0, we have perfect autocorrelation. We have a correlation of 1, which makes sense. yt and yt is perfectly correlated. They're perfectly correlated with each other. If we look at lag, say, 1, you see your autocorrelation here 
when you have memory parameter of one half is around 0.75 but when you have the higher memory parameter you see a much higher correlation and really again this is nothing more than the graph of phi to the h but you see as you go further along the h axis the autocorrelation for the memory parameter 0.5 case falls much more quickly than when you have 0 0.9 which should make sense the higher the autocorrelation well the, the, the higher the memory parameter the more the process remembers something about its previous values so when you have a higher phi a larger phi this autocorrelation is dropping to zero much more slowly than for a smaller value of phi. So you see here for the phi equals one half case, by the time you're out to 13 or 14 for h, your autocorrelation is getting very close to zero. Some more examples where you see even more dramatic drop-offs. So here again, here we have a phi of 0.75, this one again is 0.5 and then we have the lowest curve is 0.25 but notice your your h here the largest value for the h axis is actually 6 and you see that with these lower values for phi we're dropping off much more quickly With that said, let's see what some of these things actually look like. So this is an, an actual possible scenario for an AR1 process with a large memory parameter of 0.9. And you can see a pattern. You can see here, you could almost draw a continuous curve through this. And the reason for that is because any one of these points remember what, what this means, a phi of 0.9, is it remembers, and by the way, notice all of these examples were setting the mean to be zero. Your yt is remembering 90% of yesterday's value plus a new epsilon term. And notice this is important, we're writing it this way, we can write it this way because the mu is zero, so we don't have to subtract out that mu. But it makes sense that today's observation is close to yesterday's because it remembers that yesterday value at the 90% level and then adds a new noise term. So you can see that this is the reason why a lot of these points are close to one another for adjacent time periods. If we drop the memory parameter a little bit, say to 0 0.75, you can see the same type of phenomenon, but it's not as strong this is starting to look a little noisier. And when we say noisier, think of the illustration of just a white noise. What you, what you think of as a white noise, you know, the, the sound that you would hear with, say, a, a radio station with no actual uh, broadcast radio signal where you're trying to actually hear something. So again, you can see quite a bit more structure when you have this memory parameter at 0.9. You can still see that kind of structure in this graph of this AR1, but it's less pronounced. If we go down to a memory parameter of 0.5, you can still see some pattern here. You can see you're still getting some of these points clustered together because they're remembering 50% of the value from the previous time step. But the effect is dampened quite a bit compared to the other two. If we go down to 25% memory, now it's starting to look very noisy. You're still seeing some of these clusterings. Because remember, we're still remembering, right? In this case, you're remembering 25% of that previous term. 
And then if we go down to say 0.1, now this is looking much less so like there's any type of memory. I mean, there's, there is some, but in this case, it's very slight. So it's only remembering 10%, each term is remembering 10% of the previous term. So we're progressively getting more and more noisy. The other case that we haven't touched on is the case where phi is in size less than one, but it's negative. And this is a little strange because here's an example where we have phi is negative 0.95 to illustrate, but this is saying that your observation today remembers negative 95% of the observation from yesterday plus your random noise term. And that's why you get this kind of banded looking structure. And it's because, say, look at this first observation. So that looks like it came out, came out around 5.5. But the second observation came out close to negative 5.5. Well, that's because in that case, let's just write that out. If we had y naught was starting at 5.5, then our AR1 equation here tells us y1 is negative 0 0.95 times that 5.5 plus the epsilon t term. So it's remembering 95% of 5.5, but it's multiplying by minus 1, then add in the noise term. So that kicks you down here. It, it leapfrogs you over the h, the t axis. And that, and that is why we have this banded structure, because every time we're getting this 95% memory, we're flipping the sign. And so you're bouncing over the t axis with each successive term. And because of that, you get an interesting looking autocorrelation function, which is depicted here. So at lag one, you have this autocorrelation close to negative one. But at lag two, right, because you have minus one times minus one, the autocorrelation flips back up to being positive and large. And you can see that here. So these two observations, for instance, would be the first and the third. And you're seeing high autocorrelation between them. So if you just ride along the top of what looks like this colored in area here, that's why you're seeing autocorrelation at lag two. Similarly, you're seeing autocorrelation at lag two down here. So the autocorrelation functions are kind of funny when you have a phi that is negative. We can look at another example where you have a the memory parameter being a little bit smaller, but still negative, smaller in the absolute value, so 0.75. And you see a similar kind of structure, but it's looking noisier than what we had in the negative 0.95 case. And you see a similar ACF but notice it's decaying to zero much more quickly. So the ACF at the negative 0.95 level at lag one was much closer to minus one. So that, that sums up the properties, the basic properties of autocorrelation functions for the AR, AR1 process. And you, you can derive these. Uh, it's a common exercise to derive these types of autocorrelation and autocovariance functions, really what happens is you dig into the definition itself. So you would plug, in order to do this calculation, you would take the expression for yt here and plug it in to this covariance term. And then you would write down the expression for yt plus h, basically increment every t here. 
by adding h, write down the expression here, and then actually do the covariance calculation. We leave that to an exercise, as it's fairly standard in a common homework assignment. But this sums up the properties and kind of the feel of autocorrelation of an AR1 time series. And it's important to recognize that we're focusing on the case when phi is in absolute value less than one because one of our goals is to come up with a robust set of models for stationary time series. And the AR type of processes will play a key role in that. And they, they do have this restriction of phi being smaller than one, but eventually we will be combining autoregressive processes with other types of processes to get this robust model for stationary time series, which we will call ARMA models. And then we will move from that to ARIMA models.